Hello, my name is Sean Folsom, and I'm going to be showing you some ancient Greek instruments. First, we're going to start off with the monochord, which was supposedly invented by Pythagoras somewhere around 550 BC. The monochord means one string, mono being one, chord being string. There's a, a string under tension with this peg here. There's two bridges, and this could be said to be the fundamental note. And this uh, vibration goes from this bridge all the way to this bridge and back. And as I pluck it, the string loses energy and the sound dies away. So this box is for resonation. We might actually hear it a little bit better when it's off the knee. So it's just a hollow box. I made this myself just from materials at the lumber yard. Now, uh, interestingly enough, a third bridge is introduced. And as you move the bridge up and down, you get a faster vibration as a shorter length, or a slower vibration as you go a longer length of string. Now, Pythagoras moved this around, and through direct experimentation, he found that if you have it right in the middle, these two notes are exactly the same on either side of this middle bridge. And uh, the vibration that's produced by either side of the string, or the either side of this bridge, is exactly twice the rate of the lowest vibration. So if we have this vibration, let's say, just uh, suppose at 220 hertz, 220 cycles per second, this under here would be, this would be 440 exactly double the rate on this side or this side. Now he found out that there are other relationships and so on, but we're not going to get into those right now. Suffice it to say that if we move the bridge bridges here to either side in, and now we've got a different length of string, the same proportions still apply. So let's see. Here's uh, the fundamental. And then if we put it under here, and if we, if we get it to match exactly, now I've just found exactly where the middle of the string is. And this is twice as fast, either this or this, as this vibration here. And uh, it doesn't matter how long or short the string is, these proportions still apply. So Pythagoras used it to suggest that number is inherent in all things, and it was part of his mysticism. So knowledge of this um, later uh, translated out of classical Greek and classical Roman Latin into Arabic by Arab scholars, and out of Arabic into medieval Latin by Jewish scholars in Spain. and. Uh, uh, in another segment, I'll do another type of instrument that kind of has features of the medieval monochord. But this is the classical Pythagorean monochord. So I was saying I was going to uh, suggest that on the next segment, which I do with the Elizabethan instruments, you'll get to see a type of monochord that's been adapted to bowing. It's called the nickel harpa. But it has features of the medieval monochord. That, that was developed in the 16th, uh, 12th century. So anyway, uh, this is the monochord of Pythagoras. Now we go on to the shrinks. The shrinks is the classic pan pipe. You now pan pipes uh, or pan flute have a worldwide distribution. There's ones in Africa, uh, Polynesia, China, Romania, and of course South America, Central and South America. Now the uh, Romans cut their pan pipes to lengths, to different lengths, and uh, but the Greeks actually filled theirs with wax to different depths. And like the monochord, the octave, which is here, is only half the distance of this or depth of this tube. So this being one note, say Do in the scale, 
this is though an octave higher. And what we have here is the lower tetrachord of four notes, tetra being four, and then the upper tetrachord. So that goes like this. So this high note is going twice as fast as the vibration in this tube. And this note is the eighth note. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The octave. And this is only half the length of the lower do or key note here. So this shows musical proportion just like the monochord, where you have the bridge in the middle of the string, exact middle, you have what the Greeks call the octave. But I didn't want to say that till I actually explained it with this instrument. So here we go, uh, just a free association improvisation on the shrinks. <laughs> to marry Hans Sylvanus and uh, she changed into reeds by the riverbank. Han walked by, recognized her in a new form and said, well, shrinks, if I can't marry you in your present form, in your regular form, I'll have you as this. And that is how he invented the pan flute or pan pipes. Now, uh, the next instrument, also of wind instrument nature, is the alos. And the three parts of the alos are the glottis, which is the tongue with a reed in it, reed in it with a tongue in it, <laughs> and uh, the homos bulb, and then the bombix. Now, some of them had more holes and some had less, but this one is a, uh, uh, it has four holes in the front and a back thumb hole. And it's paired up with the exact same instrument on this side and uh, I have the thumb holes slanted away so that they can favor either right or left thumbs. Now in use this is used with a technique called circular breathing. <laughs> scale. Now if we take the homos bulb out of one of them and move the glottis into the bombix, now we're shortening the alos to a fourth higher. Now of course you can lengthen or shorten the alos to accompany female voices which are high pitched or male po uh, voices which are low pitched by lengthening the tubes. So professional allets carried around different bits and pieces and would put together through modular construction put together different lengths. So uh, it was believed that the allos made it possible for you to throw the discus farther uh, to uh, do the broad jump, far, broad, broad jump farther, and a bunch of other activities that were done with this, like exercises of military nature done by light infantry called hoplites. Uh, there were sailor songs. There was just literally no human endeavor in ancient Greece that could not be accompanied with the alos, or as modern Greeks pronounce it, aflos.